Okay, to keep us on time, I'm going to start my somewhat missable introduction. Uh, and anyone who shows up a few minutes late will not be disappointed. <laughs> but uh, thanks again to everybody who is joining us. My name's Liberty, and I'm a member of the Firestorm Collective. Tonight, we're excited to host anti gentrification activist Andrew Lee in conversation with Vicki Osterweil. Lee's new book, Defying Displacement, Urban Recomposition, and Social War, investigates gentrification from the perspective of those fighting it, exploring how a profound transformation of global cities transforms the possibility of liberation and revolt. If you don't already know, Firestorm is an almost 16-year-old radical bookstore owned and operated by a queer feminist collective in Southern Appalachia on the land of the Cherokee people. Uh, we strive to feature books and events that reflect our interests and the needs of marginalized communities in the South. And uh, although we took a little break, we are continuing to book uh, virtual events like this one, both because we love to be able to reach folks at a distance, uh, authors and uh, attendees, and also because we know that uh, in this continuing pandemic time, uh, virtual events provide a level of accessibility, which is hard to replicate. So uh, with that in mind, tomorrow night, we'll be hosting Angela Hume, author of Deep Care, for a discussion on the history of underground abortion services in the US. I hope you'll join us. Uh, it's uh, similar to this event, one that you will need to register for. So after this event, go over to our website and register if you haven't already. Uh, and if you're interested in keeping up with our events more generally, uh, you could follow us on social media. Um, and I'll share a link to our newsletter in the chat. So tonight we are using um, Zoom webinar, which is a little restrictive in some ways that can be kind of annoying, but uh, we would love to hear from you. And the best way to do that is to use the Q&A tool. Um, so it's probably somewhere down there at the bottom of your screen and definitely throughout the evening as topics come up that you're interested in exploring more, you have questions about, please feel free to go ahead and write out um, a question uh, for Andrew and Vicki. Uh, so uh, let's get started. Andrew Lee uh, participated in a multi-year fight against the construction of a Google campus in San Jose, California that culminated in the creation of the first community land trust in so-called Silicon Valley. He currently lives in Pennsylvania and is a member of the No Arena in Chinatown Solidarity Group, um, which is opposed to a planned 76ers arena. Lee supports grassroots social movements uh, as managing editor of the ARD and Dismantled Magazine. And his work has previously appeared in Yes Magazine, The New Inquiry, Teen Vogue, and Roar Magazine. Uh, Vicki Osterweil is a writer editor and agitator, and a regular contributor to The New Inquiry. Uh, her book, In Defense of Looting, A Riotous History of Uncivil Action, was released in 2020 by Bold Type Books. I will note that it has still not come out in paperback. I'm waiting. Um, but her writing has additionally appeared in The Baffler, The Nation, The Rumpus, Real Life, and Al Jazeera America. So really pleased to have both of y'all here. Um, I'm extremely interested to hear what you have to say tonight. And Andrew, uh, reading your book has been a real pleasure. So if you want to go ahead and take it away, thank you so much. Thank you. No, it's really great to be here. And I'm very excited to be able to have this conversation uh, with folks. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks so much. Uh, and yeah, the paperback thing is, I harass them once every few months about it. It's it's very frustrating. Anyway, um, but that's, not, that's neither here nor there, because we have an excellent paperback to talk about today, which is um, Andrew Lee's uh, Defying Displacement, which has just come out and which I think is a really um, valuable and exciting contribution to the way we think about um, struggle, uh, cities, place and space, um, and also just in general sort of strategies and the economy um, at broad. It's a big book. Um, it, it takes big swings. And that's that's the kind of book I love to read. And it does it all in a small package. So I'm very honored and excited to be here with you, Andrew. Um, presenting uh, your book, and I'm going to be asking uh, Andrew some questions, um, let him expound on the things, the ideas that he's working through, um, and then uh, and then we'll open up to the Q&A, um, which should be about 90 minutes. So um, yeah, really excited. Liberty, thank you again. Um, thanks again to Firestorm, like truly one of the greatest uh, institutions uh, here on this entire East Coast, and 
Um, I always love I love doing anything with and for y'all. So thank you so much for hosting us. Um, so yeah, Andrew, um, basically uh, your book, Defying Displacement, uh, really centers around um, gentrification, but I think it takes a both, not exactly a different tack, but a broader and more systemic tack um, than I think a lot of accounts of gentrification do elsewhere, um, particularly in the popular imagination. So I guess I would love for you to start by sort of talking about what you mean when you say gentrification and how you combine or compare sort of the idea of displacement versus gentrification and how you are using those two ideas um, together in the book. Yeah, uh, so gentrification, it gets used in a lot of different ways. I think kind of muddy the waters. Um, some people use it to refer to basically neighborhoods getting nicer, right? Getting more capital invested, getting streets repaired, any sort of neighborhood improvement. And I think that's really wrong, right? Like when, when middle-class suburban homeowners improve their properties, no one says that that's gentrifying. The word gentrification came from, comes from a British sociologist named Ruth Glass, whose book, London Aspects of Change, first defined gentrification as uh, the, quote, invasion of working class neighborhoods by the middle class, right? So gentrification, I think, inherently involves displacement, and we need to think of it as a form of economic displacement. I think the challenge with a lot of the popular narratives and discourse around gentrification is it kind of stops at a sort of hand-wringing like, oh my God, am I a gentrifier, right? Which is something that folks should ask themselves, but that also can't be the whole narrative because when we're talking about that, it's really a form of ethical consumerism, right? It's like, should I the affluent potential gentrifier consume a housing in this neighborhood, or should I consume a housing in this other neighborhood? And the challenge with being limited to that framing is like all forms of ethical consumerism, it threatens to obscure the political and economic forces, which in with anyone is making consumption decisions. And the, the fight about gentrification gets shrunken down to the fight within like a conflicted maybe gentrifier's soul, right? Um, I don't want to say any of this to say like, yeah, white folks move into neighborhoods of color and do whatever insane things you want. Um, but there are structures um, behind these individual consumer decisions and there's real political economic state power, right? Gentrification is something that's engineered, it's planned, it's planned at the level of municipal policy, it's planned at the level of international um, financial decisions and investment choices. And it's something that's happening um, in cities all across the world and sparking some of the most militant class-based resistance we can see around us. And I think it's such a disservice um, to these actual struggles, to our communities, to our neighbors, to be content with a conversation that's just like, should someone who's a gentrifier feel bad? To what degree is this individual person a gentrifier or not? While at the same time, your local government is plotting entire communities getting decimated, right? Thank you, thank you, Andrew. That was that was really clear. And 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 as ever, you teed up my next question, which I really appreciate since since I haven't prepped okay. you yet. So thank you so much. So yeah, I think um maybe a way we can get into this sort of this bigger question, um getting beyond the the internal um individualized uh, consumerist sort of way of thinking about it is is the concept that you say, which is the gentrification economy. Um, which you used to talk about how it functions sort of on a global scale. Um, I was wondering if you could sort of describe the gentrification economy and in doing so maybe touch on some of those struggles that you talk about around the world. Because I think one thing that was really refreshing for me about your book um, was just putting all these struggles that I had paid attention to and that, you know, like the anti, sorry, now I'm going to name a few, sorry, I'm cutting, but like, you know, the struggles in Brazil against fair rises and in Chile as well. And, you know, Occupy Nigeria, which was over gas prices and like sort of thinking about all of these different struggles that I had 
sort of individualized and and seeing the threads of displacement through all of it um, was very helpful. So if you want to touch on some of that, that would be that would be awesome. In situations of gentrification, um, there are often sort of like gratuitously cartoonishly evil villains at play, like developers, like white people on next door. Like there's a lot of sort of oafish cartoonish villains. And I think, I'm not saying we shouldn't personalize struggle against our enemies and say, oh no, that person individually really kind of sucks, right? I think there's definitely a place for that, but cities are gentrifying because there's money in it. And that's a new thing. Like you think about like the, the post-war generation, what you had was deindustrialization and white flight, right? So um, white people with money are like fleeing inner cities, moving to segregated suburbs, the tax base is destroyed. Um, and that's the opposite of the movement that we see today. Um, where folks are coming back into inner cities. Um, and I think we can't also can't understand gentrification without thinking through deindustrialization, right? The communities that get gentrified are, at least in the US, almost exclusively urban communities of color that are working class. And there are folks who moved these cities, whole communities, populations that moved these cities to work industrial jobs, right? So in what's currently Silicon Valley, that was microchip manufacture. Back in the day in Detroit, it was automobiles. In Philly, it was textiles. Um, and all those jobs are gone, right? They're gone. They aren't coming back. Um, there was this previous era um, where we saw poor working people get concentrated in cities um, to work these sort of assembly line jobs from the late 19th through the mid 20th century. And that's incidentally where all of our theories about leftist strategy and ideology come from was that moment of like urbanization and industrial con concentration of broke people with an incentive to overthrow the system. What we see today is that the, the money for, you know, big capitalists and by extension, you know, cities, local elites is in the con concentration of highly paid professional workers um, or workers in training in finance, tech, biotech, real estate, and at elite universities. In gentrifying cities, these are the people who are getting concentrated on tech campuses, in university campuses, um, in like business districts uh, marketed for the consumption of affluent white collar workers. We also see that they're being concentrated industrially, like the largest employers in most American cities is, is an elite university. Uh, people, we see 20,000 workers on tech campuses, whereas for poor working class people, you're more likely to be working either as an independent contractor or at a mom and pop. So gentrification is in some ways an effect, like an epiphenomena of a big change in production that like econ nerds at like the World Bank and stuff call like the fourth industrial revolution, uh, the new economy, um, and which I say we could as easily call the gentrification economy because it creates gentrification as like a rational product, right? When this form of production that requires the concentration of uh, professional, like small, small cadre of professional workers in certain key industries to capture value, gentrification becomes wildly profitable. And that's independent of the ideologies of the people in power, their political party, their political commitments. One example I think makes this really clear is for like urbanists, city people in the U.S. for the last decade and a half, the big problematic that your local government is trying to figure out right now is how do we make our city less like Detroit post-Great Recession and more like Silicon Valley, right? How do we make it less like all of these post-industrial Rust Belt cities 
and more like contemporary San Francisco, San Jose, Austin. Here's the thing about that. San Jose, the Silicon Valley is a post-industrial area, right? It urbanized to create microchips. Like there were microchip assembly lines. That's why it's a city. Uh, that's why it's an urban area. And all of that got outsourced, just like, you know, auto manufacturing got outsourced from Detroit, just like textile production got outsourced from Philadelphia. The only difference between Silicon Valley and the Rust Belt cities is Silicon Valley was able to start doing research and development for computer software and hardware. Um, they brought in gentrifiers. The difference is gentrifiers. The difference is attracting the industries that pay gentrifiers. Um, gentrification is what made it not post-industrial Detroit. So political elites in this, again, global economy, independent of folks, um, beliefs or commitments to attract capital to local areas. Local elites need to chase gentrification, which means that they need to chase um, the economic ethnic cleansing of the communities that elected them. Um, yeah, so there's a there's a dynamic. Um, thank you for that. That was that was really helpful and and I think really clear. Um, for me, anyway, but I've read the book, so um, no, just kidding. I think I think that was great, and um, I think like you know, in the book, you talk about sort of that political dynamic. Um, I wonder if you could sort of maybe get into some examples that I found really interesting. Um, you know, when you talk about they're sort of getting rid of their constituents, um, and then those constituents are being replaced. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about some of that, um, or we could sort of maybe you could touch on that quickly, and we can move on to to the next sort of question. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's we see something like really striking like you don't have to be a big believer in i don't know representative democracy in the american system to find this kind of shocking right how often local municipal elites are voting for projects that are very clearly um not only against the interests of large parts of their constituencies but will actually affect their removal and the destruction of those communities. I mean, people like to pretend that like no one could have predicted gentrification, like, oh, it just happens, like this automatic process. But when you think about it, none of these developments would make sense if they didn't cause gentrification, right? If you're creating a new district for like university students at your elite universities and no one who's living there moves out, you know, there's not going to be room for the new students, right? If, if you're planning a new business district and the corner store never leaves, um, there's not going to be retail space, right? Like they, they only make sense economically. They, they, they depend on displacement, right? Which is why I say that displacement is, is a conscious objective for local officials. So like, even if they don't have morals, even if they don't care, if all they want is your vote, why in city after city is there almost unanimous political consensus around bringing in projects that depend on gentrification, right? And I think that the answer to that is two parts, right? One is what I was just um, referring to, that like, City elites see the lack of gentrification as an existential threat for their municipal budgets, right? Um, they see if we, because of these changes in contemporary production under this latest iteration of capitalism, um, with after deindustrialization, after a degree of automation, after outsourcing, um, that the only way to have a profitable uh, municipal area is by attracting gentrifiers at the expense of working class people of color. I think the second part of this is like, you know, a lot of these decisions are happening at the local level. So on one hand, you have like, you know, the city council of Chattanooga versus like ExxonMobil or like Facebook, you know, these like giant international conglomerates that can have like exponentially many many times over more power than even national governments you know versus like you know whatever 12 losers the 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 local folks elected 
And the thing about displacement is they aren't going to be your constituents for the next election cycle, right? Like the people who are most negatively affected by displacement have already been displaced, so they can't vote you out. The people who benefit the most from displacement are the folks who got to move in to those spaces because they were designed for them, who are replacing the people moved out, and they're your, your new voters, right? They just got added to your district. Um, so I think that there are, I think that, you know, a, a lot of these decisions go through the political process, right? That there's zoning decisions or there's, you know, tax abatements. And I think it makes a lot of sense um, when folks say, you know, we have to compete in that arena uh, to a degree because otherwise they're just going to steamroll over us. I think, I think that makes sense. Um, I think we also need to understand given how given the gentrification isn't just you know the bad decision of a few bad actors but is something incentivized across the gentrification economy knowing that um there's a paradox in engaging at the municipal level given that the whole problem is people are getting pushed out of the municipality i think that we do have to be very clear and disciplined um and honest with ourselves and with our folks if we are going to see an end to displacement, right, like an end to gentrification, if if we were to create a, a structure by which communities of color in cities around the world knew that their kids could live in them if they wanted, if we knew that our homes would be safe from speculative financial investment, if we knew that we had the same degree of security that middle-class homeowners do, right, that we knew that we were not going to get priced out in two years because some guy at a hedge fund thought he could make, make, make a buck from destroying our communities. If we're going to achieve that, it will require going beyond what levers we're offered in the local electoral process, right? We can push them to vote against a mega project. We can push that to... Um, to, to, to halt something that's going to harm our communities. But if we aren't using that push to accumulate forces, um, to, to build a combative movement outside and beyond the electoral system, um, we are ultimately not going to be able to do right by our communities. Yeah, that's, um, I think that's really helpful. Um, in the book, you talk a lot about how um, Sort of, and I, I found this distinction very, very productive for me um, about how sort of gentrification happens to spaces. So, um, but what it does, it destroys places. <laughs> and often, what anti gentrification struggles or anti displacement struggles focus on is protecting a place rather than a space. Um, I know that sounded very abstract and rhymy to everyone who hasn't read the book, but if you could sort of explain those distinctions, I think it's incredibly helpful um, for thinking about both the sort of real estate spatial aspects of gentrification and of neighborhood, as well as sort of what's meaningful about that stuff. Yeah, I think, okay, so in the sense that I use them in the book, I talk about spaces as being like coordinates, like a bounded area on a map, um, right? Here's where your location is. You're at a certain address. You're at a certain latitude and longitude. Obviously displacement is about people getting pushed out of a certain area for the benefit of other people, um, especially the folks who own that property in that area. But there's also something I talk about as place. Um, so I think like, a place is something that means something to somebody, right? It's, it's like the meanings we create about a certain location that means something to us uh, culturally, historically, interpersonally. And a lot of anti-displacement fights are around specific places that are sort of invested with meaning by the folks who live there. Um, some examples I talk about in uh, the book are the First Baptist Church of, of Venice in Los Angeles, also the Mural de la Raza in San Jose, California. These are both sort of like iconic community spaces that were targeted for displacement and when it came for and when, when they came for these places, they galvanized really strong um, oppositional movements. And I think that there's a sort of 
um, uncharitable class reductionist reading that's like, oh, well, I mean, it's it's not about like money numbers and houses and stuff. So it's like the superstructure. Um, and that's stupid because <laughs> um, like the thing about gentrification, right, is that it disperses folks. So it's really hard to organize. Like it's really hard to organize because the folks you're fighting with are always getting priced out and moving away and, and you know can't stay in the fight. It's hard because folks don't like talking about not being able to pay their rent, right? Folks don't like talking about being under threat of eviction. I'm like, no one wants to talk about that stuff. Um, it, it can be very isolating in so many ways as people are getting pushed away and the people who are getting concentrated and brought together um, are the people who are benefiting from this process. So these cultural um, places getting under threat, they provide like a rallying point. They provide like a, a, a central pull to the struggle that people can relate their own individual um, struggles and concerns into. I think it also really lays bare like the, the 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 distinction between like use value and exchange value that underlies so much resistance to displacement, right? Um, a lot of these places are seen actually as having negative financial value um, to the property owners um, because you know they they don't want like a Chicano mural on the new condos, right? So I think like seeing that out in the open. Um, is very productive politically as well to say like, hey, like the utility of my community to these people who say that they own this neighborhood is nothing. It's negative, right? Exactly. And and I think, you know, you, you point out in the book just to throw on some, some extra juice on that is that like um, that the less valuable, the neighbor, less valuable in capital terms, the neighborhood is to begin with, um, the more money developers start tend to make from it because they're buying low and selling high, right? So there yeah. is also like sort of targeting that necessarily happens towards poorer communities. Um, but it, it, especially communities of color, right? Because yes, in exactly. the United States, like a black home and a white home in like equivalent neighborhoods, equivalent um, you know, conditions, everything the same except the the race of the neighborhood is the black home is valued on an average of $48,000 less than the white home, right? Yeah. So if I am, if you're a, a property speculator and you want to, you know, buy as low as possible and sell as high as possible, it is in your rational self-interest to target communities of color. Because yeah, they'll they'll get more valuable when the new university comes in. They'll get more valuable when the new tech campus opens. They'll get more valuable when um, you know they 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 fill in the potholes. But they'll also get forty eight thousand dollars more valuable if you change it from a black neighborhood to a white neighborhood, right? Um, I think that is like that's the truth in like a white supremacist housing market. Um, so I think it like it is no accident. That it that com it is communities of color in urban areas, sort of post-industrial communities of color that are targeted for gentrification, you know, almost every time, um, because that is in the actual financial interest of the people um, engineering mass displacement. Like, even if. Like if, if you're like a property developer and you're like that like proverbial white person who's like, oh, I don't see race. I don't see, I don't care if you're black, white, yellow, brown, purple, like I, I don't see race. Like even if, even if you didn't actually didn't see race, you had no personal racial animosity in your heart and you only cared about maximizing uh, your profits, you would every time target a neighborhood of color. Yeah. Um, I think that's really uh, that's a really a really valuable thing to to think about, and I think that that it's really important to recognize the ways that the the market and the system is white supremacist. So the developers very well may also be, <laughs> but that this is this is going to function structurally in a very deep way in a cyclical way, not necessarily on a sort of moment to moment basis, which understandably is how 
gentrification is experienced on the ground because this is a block by block process, right? People are like, oh my God, suddenly there's all these white, you know, artists on my block, like we're fucked, you know? Um, obviously like that's that's the 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 lived experience of it. Um, so I think it's valuable to be able to to hold both of those at, at once. Um, but speaking of uh, being fucked, um, and you were saying that you, uh, you know, that it's, we get dispersed by gentrification, right? That, that neighborhoods and, and places are sort of smashed. Um, in the book, I think one of the things that's really interesting that you talk about is how that necessarily has to change the way we think about organizing, the way we think about social movement, um, and how sort of the new economy and the sort of new forms of spatial organization and the organization of people um, means that, you know, by capital, like by the by the system, means that we also have to organize in a different way. Um, could you speak to some of these ideas that that are working through the book um, that I think are are quite quite fruitful? Absolutely. Um, I think, yeah, like a, a lot of our ideas about how to organize descend from like the Second Industrial Revolution, right? The late nineteenth, early twentieth century, where people started, you know, developing all of these ideologies and basically like any form of left thought, like anarchism, Marxism, social democracy, whatever, if you trace it back, right, descends from something in that time period where there was mass urbanization, uh, mass industrial concentration, so people moving from like small like village workshops to like big sweatshops, and like already existing worker revolts, right? All of a sudden everyone was working in Manchester making fabric and people were like already trying to go on strike. And then uh, people like saw that and was like, given this, here's what we should do. And basically all of the political left is just like a different answer to that question, right? Given urbanization, industrial concentration um, and existing worker revolts, we should, you know, vote for a socialist candidate like form like a vanguard party to like unite intellectuals and militant workers, you know, organize a federated series of committees to like do a general strike, whatever it is, pick your poison. But that, that's where all of this came from, was like answers to that question, right? And what we have now is kind of like the diametrically opposed version of that, right? where we're getting pushed out, we're getting dispersed geographically and industrially, and it's, you know, wealthy workers and business owners who are getting concentrated in city cores and concentrated at large employers like universities and tech firms. So I think that we really need to think through this in our action um, so that we aren't trying to copy down the answers that worked a um, hundred years ago. I think that, for instance, we have, I think, and like people are really into the idea of like unionization, right? Um, a bit of a, it's a bit of a fetish. It's sort of a it's a it, it's, it is an ideological union. fetish. Yeah, which yeah. is not to say that it isn't important or that you shouldn't do that or that I, you know, God forbid, haven't done it myself. Um, but I think we do have an idea that like the way to organize, but like, like it's like workers of the revolutionary class. I am a worker. The way to organize as workers is at the point of production. Um, therefore, if I'm organizing at the point of production, I bring the revolution closer, right? And this is actually like this framing was coming out of that third, that second industrial revolution moment, right? Where it's like people thought workers were the revolutionary class because they were being concentrated in wealthy cities because they were already fighting back. And because when they fought back, um, they shut down the global economy, right? And today, you might be working at a coffee shop and you're like, I am a worker, which is true. And it's like revolution, workers are, are the universal revolutionary class. And therefore, if I organize at my coffee shop, I'll bring the revolution closer. Your coffee shop's going to go out of business, right? Like I, the, the problem with small shop organizing is that the small shops usually just go out of business because, you know, if your employer has like 50 competitors in your city, and they pay for your health insurance, they're, they're just going to go out of business, right? Like they, the market can't support that, right? Um, the people who are organizing and are able to win some stuff from union campaigns, um, 
grad students, grad students, or people who are, are may not be there yet, but are training to be these sort of like professional class, white collar, relatively affluent positions. Um, and they're all together next to each other on a campus in the middle of a city, right? And that university is like the largest employer in the city, right? It's kind of like um, the, 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 the textile factory, right, of Manchester. But those folks also have dramatically opposed interests to the folks they're pricing out of their neighborhoods, right? But I think that like our movements are already grappling with the dynamics of gentrification. We just might not be thinking through it that way. Um, and I think one really clear example is during the George, George Floyd rebellion in 2020, everyone went to the highways, right? Everyone went to your nearest highway. And it's not because, you know, the, the secret central committee of George Floyd said, tell them all to go to the highways or someone wrote like a really compelling zine and mailed it to every info shop that was like, go to the highways. Um, although guns, cars, autonomy was pretty compelling, but that's not like those who went to the, the <laughs> highways. Um, right. So it's like, like, why did that happen? And I, I think it's like people saw it working in other cities. Right. People saw like, oh, when they did this in New York, oh, when they did this in San Diego, oh, when they did this, wherever it was, it shut everything out and got national media attention. Right. And so I think people figured out, like, if there's something that 200 people who are not armed want to do to shut down a city, you're going to go on the highway. It seems like that was the correct answer. And I think that. Just like the Estadito Social in Chile, right, which was like the, the, the fair hike turnstile jumping in like 2014, I think, um, you know, Santiago, Chile, um, just like many American cities, is rapidly gentrifying. So people had to use the metro more as they're getting priced farther out from downtown. So when they increased the fares, it has a much stronger impact on working class folks because it's like mandatory. Like you have to use it to get back to work, to get back to school. I think we see the same thing in American cities, right? Like as people are getting priced out, these transportation networks become much more important. Um, so people identified this, right, as a tactical weakness in metropolitan areas um, and then like implemented the, the correct like counteroffensive. Um, but I think like this only makes sense because of, among other things, gentrification, right? Like like th th that's sort of the 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 structure underneath this that that makes it such an appealing target. And this goes back to the police murder um, of Mike Brown of Ferguson, which is a um, impoverished black uh, suburb outside of St. Louis, right? It's like half an hour outside of St. Louis. Um, which is, again, this is a pattern of gentrification, right? Like concentrated urban poverty is getting turned into dispersed suburban poverty, you know, still racialized, still over-policed. So when people started fighting back in Ferguson, a, a, a town that no one had ever heard of before, right? The only reason that that became um, national news, right? Is because people took the highway. People took the highway into St. Louis. People made the strategic decision, like the way that we can maximize our power is by choking off this highway. And that's why we know, that's why we know his name, right? That's why this movement of, of, of the last, you know, God, almost, almost decade now has, has happened, right? Because people understood the strategic and tactical context. Um, and I think that's the kind of thing I hope that we can try to start thinking through and really grapple with this, um, the changes in cities through displacement. I guess the, the negative counterexample to that is sort of at the tail end of the rebellion. Um, I think in a lot of cities when, you know, people got convinced to not to get off of the highway to follow either nonprofits um, or socialist parties on these sort of like absurd stage managed permitted marches um, to city hall, right? Yeah. Um, 
one thing you may have noticed if you went on any of those was there was no one there. There was no one at City Hall um, because of gentrification, right? Like the, the urban cores of cities around most municipal buildings are like places for white collar workers to get lunch, right? Um, they're like office buildings, maybe like overpriced cafes. Um, so in the evening when there's a protest, there wasn't anyone there. And that might have been different in the 50s or the 60s, right? Depending on the city, depending on the location of, of different communities. But, you know, in, in 2020, it was absolutely true, right? The, the, the center, um, like the central urban areas had been, you know, entirely taken over for professional white collar gentrifiers. Um, but because there's so much sort of symbolic power, you know, folks are like, yeah, let's let's go to 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 City Hall. But like, yeah, there there wasn't anyone there. <laughs> yeah, no, and I mean, I think I think this was um in Philly. I know there are other cities like this, but but here in Philly, like there's there's a particularly empty uh, circle you can do down streets designed specifically to hold to keep crowds away um, on the parkway between the sort of the the um, art museum and the, sorry this is very specific to Philly but but it, but I think this is a very common experience um, during protest marches of sort of walking in empty empty areas um, that that you know who is it for it's sort of for ourselves um, and how do we sort of think through the effects of gentrification when we're thinking about how we plan where we're marching even if, if we decide to march um, there's a question here uh, in the Q&A that I think fits in pretty nicely into the flow. Um, we might go back to just talking you and I, but if people have more questions, please go ahead. But I'm just going to read you this question from Michael. Um, I think it's a, it's a good uh, a good prompt. So uh, Michael writes, uh, San Francisco Yimby High Priestess Sonia Trous has claimed that gentrification is actually a net good for urban land equity because it's, quote, the revaluation of Black land to its correct price. Uh, thoughts? <laughs> oh man, Sonia Trous, what a what a gem! Um, there's a there's a whole chapter, like mini chapter in my book about my thoughts about Sonia Trous. So yeah, <laughs> um, make sure you pick up a copy if a copy if you're also a fan. Um, yeah, so just for folks who don't know, like Yimby's like yes in my backyard. So it's um a bunch of dweebs who are like we need to build more market rate housing and uh, of any sort to address the housing crisis. Cause you know, if there's more of a commodity, it's price will go down. When you actually look at the numbers for like, the housing market as I did, so you don't have to, um, it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, and yeah, the, 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 the San Francisco Yimbies are particularly um onerous they're they seem to be like almost all like tech workers who are just like um like doing free canvassing for property developers and there was like a really cool um a really cool incident where there were a bunch of like chinese elders protesting and then the yimbis like came and like yelled at them and like one of them had like a like a seizure or something it, it was a mess it was a mess yeah that's bad i think that look on an individual level yeah like if you're a homeowner and your property value goes up that's all things considered a good thing right um i think when you look at what this actually looks like for folks right it's not a lot of people are often not saying you know I'm going to sell my home because I wish to make a profit and invest my proceeds. People are often moving out because their property taxes, which are tied to that housing valuation, get so high that they can no longer pay them. So they're forced to sell. And then the question is, where can you buy property, right? Can you buy another property? Will you be a renter forever? And it certainly will not be in the community that you left, right? If you are from like a, a, a concentrated tightened community of any sort and you're priced out through gentrification, um, you're probably going to be living in a much more remote area and commuting back to work. 
Um, you might be forced out of the urban area entirely. Um, you will probably not for that amount of value, you, you aren't going to be able to purchase a home in a similar neighborhood because of these inflated property values. Um, something else that we should really be clear on is like the neighborhoods that are targeted for gentrification, as I've said, are neighborhoods of color. These are like ethnic enclaves. These are communities that were created through um, redlining, through racial violence, through white paramilitary violence, further down, you know, through the dirty wars, through the cold war, through trade deals, through Jim Crow, the transatlantic slave trade, right? That's why these communities exist. Um, it's why folks are here. So these are off, like these are like communities um, with like a, a racial or linguistic character. And for that, there's no plan B, right? So I'm a member of the Norman and Chinatown Solidarity Group here in Philly these days. And, you know, we have a, a downtown Chinatown that's being targeted um, by the Philadelphia 76ers for a new arena or their billionaire owners rather. Um, and something that we talk a lot about is like, there is no plan B for Philadelphia's Chinatown, right? Like if folks get priced out, there's no like slightly worse second tier downtown walkable concentrated Chinese American community with, you know, centuries of history, right? Like that's the community will just no longer exist, right? Folks are going to find other, right? Like there, there's folks up in Northeast, for instance, here in Philadelphia, but like it is not the same. Like it is not a downtown community. It does not have the history. It does not have the social ties. It does not have all the things uh, that the community fought for and built for itself. Like the, the religious institutions, the school, all of these things, they, that would no longer exist. So I think that's also part of what, um, our Caucasian nemeses like Sonia Trous um, try to obscure. It's like, oh, you mean, yeah, the 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 numbers go up, right? Like the the property value goes higher, and you can sell it for more money, and like the school's better. Um, but like, there is, I mean, first of all, there's just economic costs involved with being forced to move, right? These people never seem to talk about, right? Like, but like, obviously, right? Like, there's there are many costs on a number of levels involved with having to move. Um, but even aside from that, right, like these are specific communities that were forged through oppression and survived through struggle um, that were only ever under attack by this country, by its owners, by its ruling class until the day that they figured out they could make a buck by displacing them. And now they have an interest. Now they have an interest in them. Um, so I think that's also part of um, the, the response to Trous, right? It's like, these are, it's not just a bunch of atomized property owners whose homes are worth more or less of money, right? These homeowners and more often than not renters are like in specific communities with specific social ties. It's real flesh and blood people you could go and talk to if you weren't such a weirdo. <laughs> yeah. And I think like um, you know, I know I know that this was this was the case in New York, um, that there are also often um sort of strategies that get devised um by city governments that seem like they're about um, helping people, for example, like a five-year uh, property tax ladder, right? Where like, oh, it can only go up by so much, by so much, by so much, tracing the um, tracing the, uh, the the market value, and then it jumps, you know, after a certain point. And like, you know, I think this this gets framed as like it's going to help people. This is a sort of yimby policy, I think, in some ways. Um, but what actually ends up happening is that it means that it's enough time that the services never get better, while the people who are still there are there. It takes a few years for them to get displaced. Then, when that actual jump hits and the the last of them, the last of the homeowners get pushed out, then they can start really putting in the services, right? So there's like ways in which this stuff can get very gritty, uh, and I don't, we don't need to get super granular there um, on on all of those things. But I think that I think that there's a lot of ways that um, these policies can get described as helping. Um, you know, I think you talk a lot about sort of the the use of uh, 
the use of the claim of affordable housing, right? And like the unenforceable, affordable by whose definition, like all of this is just, there's, there's just all these different ways that this language gets used to imply that things are getting better in a neighborhood. Um, and I think that's why sort of space versus place is so helpful. Before we jump to there's there's two great questions here. I'm gonna, I'm, we're gonna get to them, uh, but I just wanna give one sort of zoom out question because I think we've got some really great sort of uh, tight questions about being in a city. Um, so the zoom out question I think is one thing that's really helped me with with this book and with thinking about displacement um, as the way of thinking about a sort of urban and even international um, organization style has obviously been uh, Palestine um, and has been the sort of the, the really open settler colonial genocide. Um, but as you pointed to in, in your response to the last question, all of these neighborhoods were formed by similar settler processes um, in the U.S., right? Similar processes of racial sorting, um, of being made, you know, uh, vulnerable to premature death, as Ruth, Ruth Wilson Gilmore puts it. Um, so could you talk a little bit about displacement um, and settler colonialism, sort of how it, how it functions on this sort of historical national scale, if you want to get into that? And then we can jump into these questions, which are, which are already so great. I'm excited to do. Yeah, I, I don't want to flatten anything or overstate the like correspondence between things, but I mean I, I think that there is there is a lot to unpack. I think that I mean a lot of people in I mean people talk about gentrification as colonialism, I think, very frequently in anti-displacement fights. And um, I think it makes a lot of sense, right? Because it's like, there, 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 there's a very clear sense that policies are being made and legislation introduced and decisions being made on behalf of people who are not you um, by other people who also do not live there. Um, I think that, you know, and even in, you can see the shift, I think, even in, in in places where it's like, we know our local government has never given a shit, like, we know that, but, but again, like, now, now we, like, see that it's very clear, it's not even about us, right, um, like, I mean, it's, it, it's very blatant, um, I think that the, the only thing I would add to that is I, I would I would call it a form of like neo settler colonialism, right? It's not just about like you can talk you could think about right like sort of like impoverished industrial areas of the U.S. Um, in mid century, right? As people just having like a colonial aspect, right? Where like things were getting like that they didn't have effective democratic control and like resources are getting sucked out for other people it was actually it was um sorry it was a popular it was a popular argument of the the usa the communist party of the usa uh, harry haywood in particular loved the sort of the internal colonization um and the black panthers toyed with that a bit before moving towards intercommunalism so yeah it's a it, it had a long tradition there for sure i think what we can see today is more akin to to settler colonialism right it's not that we want to rule a subject population from afar disenfranchise them and extract wealth it's like we want them gone right we want them dispersed we want them gone right it's like you can look at the wildly inadequate homeless policies of every city in this country as just like buffoonery or ignorance but it isn't right like they have staff members right they can read books, right? They have like think tanks and policy gurus and, right? Like they know, they know they what know. they're doing. They, they know want they're people, doing. right? Um, they want these communities obliterated um, because it will make them a profit. Similarly, I think there are definitely like specific things going on in Palestine with like the history of, of the Zionist political project. But I do think that one thing to note is where Israel gets all the money to commit genocide. And people in the US often think it's petroleum because it's in the Middle East and that's not true. 
the biggest sector in the Israeli economy is tech. Um, they do a lot of tech R&D there, and they've positioned themselves between the U.S. and China so that firms like Huawei and firms like IBM both have um, like R&D tech campuses in Israel. It's the biggest component of their national economy. Um, so just like gentrification in the U.S. is financed by these uh, wealthy industries like tech and biotech, um, we can see in you know a, a much worse iteration how, how that same financing, the same position within the gentrification economy is also permitting uh, the destruction of Gaza. Yeah, I think that's right. And, I, and, and, and the fact that those, um, that those Israeli tech firms also tend to be um, more focused on military and surveillance tech um, rather than the U.S. and China, which are their companies tend to be more focused on consumer tech. I think that's very telling as well, right? Um, because of how this all works. But anyway, um, I'm going to move to some questions. These are all great. Please keep them coming. Um, I'm going to start. Um, and thank you all again so much for being here with us and 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 having this this I think very important and exciting conversation. Um, so thank you. Um, so I'm going to start with um, someone anonymous um, who I think has has put their finger on something very interesting. Um, one of the effects of gentrification that I've noticed is a constant lack of housing. Low-income communities are then pushed into different low-income communities that cannot handle it and then themselves are pushed out, uh, is, is the implication. What are your thoughts on a possible cycle of displacement, the way that these sort of, you have these sort of waves of displacement going on? Yeah, I think that's definitely true. Um, you know, it's it's certain blocks that are targeted within urban areas for intensive capital reinvestment um, because of the financialization of the housing market, which basically just means that like large international financial institutions play a, pre a preponderant role. I'm not just like local garden variety rich people. It can happen very fast, right? An intensive amounts of capital can be poured into very concentrated areas. Um, so like in in no city, there, there's no city where where most of it is actively gentrifying in this sense. Um, it's specific neighborhood, specific areas that are targeted for reinvestment. So yeah, those people are getting priced out um, into other working class, um, less gentrifying neighborhoods, right? Um, I think it's one of the reasons why we can both and should honor the specificity of struggle and the communities are being targeted um, in terms of building alliances and demonstrating real solidarity, and also understanding that we are all implicated um, and all affected by and participants in um, a gentrification economy, right? That this is something that affects, you know, urban areas as a whole and all of us living in or around them. Um, I, I think what we can see ultimately um, through these cycles is the US is slowly approaching a global norm of wealthy cities surrounded by the poor. Um, this is the, the pattern of most cities around the world. We've had a little weird thing happen in the US because of white people and they like the white people invented suburbs. So for a while like, we had this like weird thing where like the periphery was like white middle-class racist people are we like concentrated urban poverty? But that, that was kind of like a weird aberration. So I think we're now reverting to a global norm where you have like wealthy city cores surrounded by poor peripheries. Um, and I think that creates strategic, uh, sort of tactical challenges like I identified earlier. You know, like we go to city hall and no one's there because we we don't we we misunderstand what the population distribution of the city is. Um, but it also creates um, opportunities because I think you know, that's the train of encirclement. Great. That was, um, that was great. Here's, a, here's I think, a, one that might be, might be quick, but I think is actually really, really worth uh, talking about and, and pulling out. Um, Kelly asks, um, what do you think of business improvement districts and their impact on gentrification? And Kelly is reaching in from Rochester, New York, where um, there is an active campaign uh, to create one of these business improvement districts. 
Yeah, so business improvement districts, as I understand it, are like this thing where like, like businesses in like a certain area are like, oh, we're all gonna like chip in for like services. Okay, so this is like a semi privatization or like deprivatization of like services among a bunch of like businesses, right? And I think sometimes it can be like, oh, like it, it'll be great because we have less of like a, a tax burden on the city and we're all chipping in. Um, I think like, yeah, this is absolutely about gentrification, right? Um, this is absolutely about like capital finding certain areas like downtown Rochester and being like, what if this were ours? Right. What if we were able to, like, we as individual business owners have a collective interest in the conversion of this space into a different type of space? Um, that's why we're all paying in to share the cost for certain services, which we provided to this space and only this space, because it's in all of our collective interest to fund them in this and only this space. Right. I think the, the reason why that makes sense as a business owner is gentrification. Yeah, that's. I think that's really helpful. I think that also um, makes me think about another sort of question that we haven't touched on much, but that I think is is really present in your book and I find really interesting um, that, that Rochester made me think about and also Philly, because Philly, you know, here has, there is certainly some gentrification, but it has been less successful than they want it to be here. Um, we, they haven't been able to pull tech here despite, or the movie industry, both of which they tried really, really hard to do. Um, so, you know, in the book, you talk about com competition between cities. And obviously, every city between the size of Rochester and Mexico City and Seoul, they can't all gentrify to the same, you know, degree. They can't all produce value from nothing um, in these sort of downtown cores. So could you talk a little bit about that sort of intercity competition? And then we'll hop back on to, to these great questions that we're getting. Yeah. Um, we are in an era where cities that are have access to like global capital markets which is almost all of them um are competing directly with one another to attract uh capital investment that doesn't mean that nations don't exist or that imperialism doesn't exist or that america isn't bad but there are ways right in which like San Francisco is competing against Berlin and New York and Melbourne for the new tech campus, right? Um, it's like certain cities are really like the staging ground for capital accumulation. Um, and I think this is also the 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 overwhelming importance of cities. I think is also why there is so much funding for municipal policing like in um you know cop city in atlanta like in the 80 other smaller cop cities that are being planned um not only because of the successes of the george floyd rebellion and the specter of urban ungovernability but because these 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 urban areas are extremely important for capitalist production. Um, there has been talk with, you know, the, the rise of remote working, right? That, you know, it would no longer matter. Like, yes, some techies left San Francisco, although most of them moved across the Bay Bridge to Oakland. Um, but even when people are going places for remote work, like it's not like you move anywhere it's like oh i'm gonna like software develop in like rural wyoming right like people are moving even if you're moving to like small towns people want to have like i don't know a good internet connection and like appealing shops and like nice restaurants right so even in these cases um when like cities and towns are trying to create these like upscale upmarket like commercial districts to attract remote workers um but yeah, in, in that sense, um, yeah, cities are in competition with one another. We're all seeing very similar um, forms of gentrification um, by like the same people, um, not only across the US, but around the world. Yeah, I think that um, 
you know, that, that really fits into the a thing that you talked about that I, that I hadn't really thought about until I read the book that, that I find. So it's, it's one of those things where like, once you, re, once you recognize it, you're like, Oh my God, you know, it's so obvious it's been there. Um, which is sort of tourism gentrification, right. Which obviously is like something that, you know, you know about like, um, Barcelona or Berlin, it happens a lot in Europe where one city, Lisbon for like five years becomes the sort of city of tourism and the, the city completely changes to sort of meet this tourist economy. Um, and another form of gentrification that, 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 you know, you see is around the Olympics sports, you know, I mean, we're, we're, we're fighting a sports, uh, stadium right now in Philly. Um, so I think there's all these different processes that end up using displacement um, as a strategy, using this capital investment and the land real estate value as a strategy that look very similar, but but the but the and the people consuming them are the same class of people, but they're quite far away from each other and they're not necessarily easily identified as part of the same process. So I think one of the things that I find really, really valuable about this book is being able to think all of those things together without losing their specificity because their specificity is really important, especially when we're talking about local struggles over a mural, for example, or a particular church. Um, so I'm going to just move on to a, to another question here. Cause we've got y'all are, y'all are doing, y'all are just teeing us up for sort of offering some strategies uh, of a way out. So I'm going to start with Toby. Um, Toby asks, how, as someone who lives in an area of generational poverty, as she quotes, um, do I improve the places in my neighborhood for the people who live here without triggering gentrification? For instance, we as a community do street art and traffic calming internally, then property values go up and middle class people think, hey, let's move there. That seems respectable, TM, which is very funny. Thank you, Toby. Um, so yeah, so sort of let's talk about the, yeah, I mean, answer the question, you know, answer, she, she, she phrased it well. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the challenge, right? Like, with that, and that's, that's like the challenge of like having property markets, right? That's right, of having like land as a commodity is like when things get nicer, all of a sudden folks are like, oh God, no, things got nicer. That means it's for someone else, right? Which is like horrifying when you think about it, but like, it's also very rational, right? Like, cause we know like, those things aren't for us. Um, I wish there were an easier answer, but I think what a lot, like the way to fix that in the long term is to decouple um, land from the housing market, right? Which can seem very utopian, but there, I mean, there are ways that we can do that even now, right? So community land trusts are a way to decommodify land because it says, you know, the, the land's value won't increase when the current occupant leaves. It will never go onto the market. So it's insulated from the market, right? An encampment or a squat is also decommodification of land because we're improving to sell it as a commodity, right? So like we can dream this bigger, but we can also see what it can look like right now. But I think like, yes, until to the degree that we aren't able to uncouple the value of housing and land and community to us from its value on the property market, yeah, then we are in this impossible situation, right? Where, where it's like, do I want my neighborhood to be, have like, I don't know, dangerous traffic and have like no public art? Or do I want my neighborhood to get destroyed right like obviously neither of those um but i mean i think maybe the biggest thing in the short term right is like building that sense of like solidarity where you live right the the more to which folks can have each other's backs the more that folks can like actually like foster and nourish relationships of care and mutual aid in like real material ways, right? The better chance that we have of maintaining neighborhood integrity uh, until we're able to expand these models of decommodification of land. Um, that was so great. I think I think maybe unless you're you're feeling, real saucy. I think we'll go to one more question, which I think is a great place to, to leave it. And then maybe 
um, anything that you feel you want to get to get to in the final moments we can do um, and then we can we can move forward does that sound good to you Andrew yeah great okay so um Rochester Contemporary Art Center shout out to Rochester y'all um upstate oh whatever anyway uh, I think in your book you mentioned organizing and learning across different cities many cities are being gentrified but are at different stages of the process um, how can we continue to learn from experiences in other cities and connect more fully and I think that's you know that's the crux of it what are your you thoughts on it? You have to write a book. <laughs> it's really good, folks. <laughs> it's a really good um, book. <laughs> no, I, I, I love this question. I think this is like something that I think about a lot. Um, something I know a lot of my, my comrades think about a lot. Um, so, something that's very special about Philadelphia is that um, we've had like two active, very public anti-displacement fights from two different communities at the same time, right? There was like the majority black residents of the People's Townhomes in West Philly and the campaign I'm a part of to defend Chinatown happening at the same time. People have been very conscious about like building those connections. Um, and those, I'm oh, sorry, not to interrupt, but the the activists in those also came out of the unhoused movement that emerged um, around 2020, which actually goes back to 2018. So these things have these long, long lasting um, impacts. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think something that we're also thinking about is like we like the one of the co-owners of the Sixers is like head of like tactical operations at Blackstone, the largest uh, landlord in the world that was criticized for violation, violating the human rights of housing by this like little kind of like grassroots organization. I don't know if you heard about them, the United Nations. Um, <laughs> Blackstone is like. For folks who don't know, um, because you're not horrible nerds like perhaps me and Andrew are, um, Blackstone is also the uh, the the company that bought up all of the houses basically that were foreclosed during 2008 2009. Blackstone emerged into power by buying those for a song and turning them into rental properties. So like they are more responsible than almost any other individual company for the rise of rent prices since the 2009 crash. Um, so that's the guy, that guy is also trying to evict Chinatown right now. Sorry, Andrew, I just, I, I think that context is helpful for me. Makes me angry. Yeah. <laughs> um, so like, we know that because of this financialization, right, because it's like these like transnational institutions that are targeting like specific communities, we know that we potentially have a lot of friends, right? And that we want to make those connections. Um, and I don't think we actually have a model for how to do that around housing defense and that folks are trying and we got to keep trying but i think i think we're just like developing that now or soon i mean i i i really do think back to like the beginning of labor militancy in the late 19th century in like its modern form and like there were not models for building nationwide unions there weren't models for building international, you know, revolutionary working class associations. People had to develop that because it was at a time where it started to become thinkable, right? Where people were working in these like huge factories or part of global capitalism for the first time. So all of a sudden it became possible and necessary to think about scaling up these like um, sort of like local spontaneous actions. And I don't know that we have that yet for um, housing justice and the fight against displacement. And I think one of one of the things, I think my book in part is a plea for us to be open to that possibility and to try to start thinking through that together. Um, I don't have answers. And I, I mean, I know like when it's your neighborhood, when it's your people, when it's your community, of course, like reaching out to someone from Philly or Barcelona or Cape Town or LA or like anywhere that isn't right where you are seems like an extravagant, unnecessary thing to do. Um, but I would love for there to be a way that we can figure out together how to create those connections and articulations um, because our enemies are the global ruling class, right? Not just like your garden variety capitalists, like some of the like 500 richest dudes on the face of the planet earth and their portfolios are international what if there were a way where we could link together our struggles 
so we can target them. I mean, there was a really magical moment that lasted very briefly in when I, we, I was part of a campaign against Google in San Jose, where we had this one glorious weekend where we had simultaneous actions with like unified messaging against Google developments in Berlin, Toronto, San Francisco, and San Jose. That was pretty cool. Um, I would love to see more of that. I would love for us to figure out a way to organize that, to build solidarities that um, even more than international are what Huey Newton called intercommunal, right? Not necessarily organizing as like, you know, the people of America with the people of Canada, but the people of this city and the people of this other city, these, these communities are fighting the same enemies. And how can we articulate a common struggle on that axis? I think if we are able to figure out the way that that makes sense, um, there is so much uh, that we could win for our communities and for our people. Andrew, thank you. Thank you so much um, for this this great conversation. Um, and and Liberty, thank you so much for hosting us. And thank you to Firestorm again. Shout outs to Firestorm. They're they're honestly they're the best, y'all. Um, if you don't already know. Um, yeah, uh, thank you all so much. Andrew's book is really excellent to find displacement. Um, I'm excited for all of you to get it in your hands. Um, and you can buy it through Firestorm online, I believe. Sorry, yeah. sorry. Um, which is a great way to do it. Um, so Liberty, can. I'll pass over you. Yeah. Um, yeah, just in close, uh, I'm going to put some stuff in the chat. Um, I'm going to be at various places at various dates. I have a newsletter for $0. Uh, Kelly Cheadle, I would love to do a book talk for you there, but I don't know where that is. So please reach out. Um, but yeah, I, I hope that people read the book if you feel so inclined um, and, you know, even more than that, I hope that if you aren't already, you can get involved in a local fight against displacement. I think it's some of the most vibrant, exciting work that's happening um, in the contemporary global economy. Um, and if you, if there isn't a public fight where you live, you know, there's nationwide targets for the fight to stop Cop City. That's also a fight against displacement and something that will affect um, you know, all of all of our communities, right? If they're able to build it. So thank you all. Cops will never be built. Um, throw the gentrifiers in your nearest river. And thank you for your time. Thanks, y'all. It's been an incredible pleasure. Have a good night, everyone. <laughs>